Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, April 27th, 2022, and welcome to Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we've got some Orioles news and notes to get to you here on a Wednesday. We will talk about the Orioles' tough loss at Yankee Stadium on Tuesday night, falling 12 to 10 to the New York Yankees. We will talk about some notes from the major league level for the Orioles with guys like Chris Ellis going on the injured list, Alexander Wells returning, and the O's getting some coaches back and a little mass in news as well. And then we'll talk news and notes from the minors as we've got news on DJ Stewart, news on Adley Rutschman, and some thoughts about Kobe Mayo and Grayson Rodriguez and others in their performances on Tuesday night. But a packed show coming up for you here on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So we've got Orioles news and notes for you here today. We're going to be jumping around multiple different places here on today's episode. But before we get to all that, just want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. Locked on Orioles, Monday through Friday, new episodes every day of the week. You can't get that anywhere else covering the Orioles at the major and a little bit at the minor league level as well. Again, we thank you for listening. If you listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it is, if you can leave a five-star rating and a review, that really helps us out. And of course, we're here on YouTube as well, so make sure to subscribe to the YouTube page if you're watching here, like and comment on the videos as well. And even if you're not a, a YouTube watcher, even if you're just one of the loyal listeners via the podcast, if you could just head over to YouTube, hit that red subscribe button, it really, really helps out the pod doesn't change your life at all. You don't get any annoying emails. You don't get any alerts on your phone. Nothing. It literally changes nothing but the fact that you are subscribed to the YouTube channel. And it really, really helps me out and really helps the pod out moving forward. So if you go subscribe to the YouTube channel, that would mean a whole lot. But again, just want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. And for your first listen today, Orioles news and notes, which we'll get to a little later in the pod. But first... We got to talk about last night's loss to the Yankees as the Orioles fall 12-8 in the Bronx in game one of a three-game series against the New York Yankees. Orioles dropping to 6-11 and on the season through 17 games with the loss. And going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles 12-8 loss to the Yankees. And the first thing you need to know is that, frankly, Jordan Lyles struggled once again. For Lyles, it's now been two bad starts and two good starts. And for him, you know, one of his good starts was last time out at Camden Yards against the Yankees. Went five and a third, gave up just one run, and he struck out six, and he looked pretty good. That was not the case on Tuesday night. Lyles, in the game at Yankee Stadium, got hit around and hit hard. Four and two-thirds innings, six runs on seven hits, three Ks, just one walk, but he allowed three home runs through 93 pitches and ended up giving up nine hard-hit balls in the four and two-thirds innings that he worked. And just the stuff that worked against the Yankees last time just didn't really work this time. He got eight whiffs on 93 pitches. Three were on the fastball. And, and you know, listen, four were on the slider, which has been an okay pitch this year. But really the issue for Lyles is, you know, that slider has been the go-to pitch so far this season. When it has been on, he has been on. And that thing was not good today. Now, I will give Lyles credit. The fastball command was good. He had eight called strikes with the fastball. He had three swings and misses. Ball was put in play a lot. It was a lot of strikes with that fastball, which he threw the most out of his pitches. You know, the, the four-seamer was looking good. Even the sinker that he throws as well looked really good. But the off-speed stuff was basically nowhere to be found. And that became Lyles' issue on the day. How about this stat? He only threw one off-speed pitch for a strike one off-speed pitch for a strike that uh that is not good he threw 46 off-speed pitches in total combining the slider the changeup, and the curveball only one of them was a called strike in the zone now some of them were foul balls and five of them were also swings and misses as well but uh guys were going after his pitches 
and they were having success. And the slider, he couldn't throw it for a strike. I mean, he got some swings and misses on the pitch out of the zone, but he really struggled with the command, and, and that's been his best off-speed pitch. And it just wasn't Jordan Lyles' night, and, and the Yankees really did jump all over him. Second thing you need to know from this one is that the Oriole bullpen and really the Oriole pitching staff in general had its worst game of the season. 16 games, they hadn't given up double-digit runs. The eight runs they gave up uh, in the 8 nothing loss to Tampa in the third game of the season was the most they had given up all year. Of course, they gave up seven in the loss to the Angels the last time out on Sunday, but 12 runs that they gave up Tuesday, that was the worst outing of the year. First time they'd given up double-digit runs this year comes in the 17th game of the season. And the pitching just wasn't there, and it wasn't just Lyles. This was the worst day of the year for the Oriole bullpen. I mean, they used three relievers, and nobody was really effective whatsoever. Brian Baker started off well, but then he got hit around a little bit, ended up giving up two runs on two hits over an inning and a third. Did strike out two and didn't walk anyone. He was the best out of the three relievers in this one. Paul Fry recorded only one out, two runs on two hits, a strikeout, and a walk. And Alexander Wells, who was added back to the roster, which we'll get to in a bit, inning in two-thirds, two runs, two hits. He did have three Ks and no walks, but gave up a couple of solo home runs in his outing. And I will say Baker was better than the stats showed. He just gave up a couple of hits when he came back out there, and those runs ended up scoring. But he did get five whiffs on his fastball on nine swings. That was that was pretty good for Brian Baker uh, he was throwing at 95 miles per hour. I was pretty impressed by the velo for Baker as well. So, you know, the stuff wasn't terrible for him, but Paul Fry did not look good. And the Orioles, you know, obviously the big blow in the game, besides Anthony Rizzo's three homers, which we'll get to, was Glaber Torres finally getting the Orioles. You know, he dominated the O's in 2019. And since then, he basically hasn't done anything against Baltimore. Well, that changed on Tuesday night. What ended up being the game-winning hit in this one was a bases-clearing triple for Torres off of Paul Fry in the bottom of the seventh that uh, took it from a 7-4 to a 10-4 Yankee lead at the time. And the O's did make somewhat of a comeback, as we'll get to, but just a, a bad day for the staff. Worst worst day for the Orioles pitching, which has really been the, the key factor for them. Been so, so good through the first 16 games this season. Just wasn't there on Tuesday night. Third thing you need to know, and you probably already know this, but Yankee Stadium is a Mickey Mouse stadium. This is truly the dumbest stadium in baseball. I, 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 what's going on? Like, we're, we're getting pop ups leaving the yard. Now, a credit to Anthony Rizzo, a three homer game is great. Anthony Rizzo had three home runs on Tuesday. He really, really helped the Orioles, or really, really helped the Yankees, I should say, win that ball game. But, Two of those home runs were basically pop-ups. I mean, the first home run was a three-run homer in the third inning for Rizzo with two outs. It lands essentially on top of the wall and right. Santander makes a leap for it. I'm not sure how he didn't get a glove on it, but he doesn't catch it. It lands in the first row. Expected batting average of 180 on that hit. A ball that is expected to be 180. That ball is a home run in only Yankee Stadium. Then he hits a second homer. I'll give him credit. That one was a legitimate home run. Then he hits a third homer, a solo shot in the eighth inning off of Alexander Wells. It's just a pop-up down the right field line, and it lands just inside the pole by the 314 mark. Another homer that was only a home run at Yankee Stadium. It had an expected batting average of 10. Not 110, not 210. 10. 0.010. I am not misspeaking. That is not a typo. According to StatCast, an expected batting average of 10 on that second Rizzo homer, the solo shot. Mickey Mouse Stadium. Maybe if the Yankees played at a real ballpark, they'd have some more playoff success when they go on the road. But that's just me. That's just me. Mickey Mouse Stadium helped the Yankees to four runs on those two Rizzo homers. You do the math. The Yankees won the game 12-8. Look at that. That's a four-run advantage. Mickey Mouse ballpark. Fourth thing you need to know from this one is that the Oriole offense got going a little bit, continued to get going. How about their fourth straight game with five or more runs, their fifth straight game with four or more runs, and they put up their biggest output of the year, eight runs for the Oriole offense on Tuesday night. Now, did they waste it a little bit by giving up 12 runs? 
Yes, they did. Yes, they did waste it a little bit. But eight runs is pretty good. They saw a game where Yankee starter Luis Severino was perfect through five and a third. A Jorge Mateo one-out single in the six broke up a perfect game. And the Orioles ended up taking that and still scoring eight runs through the rest of this one. I mean, they did all the score, three in the sixth, one in the seventh, and four in the eighth. It's pretty impressive. Now, it came on only seven hits, but that's because the Orioles drew four walks in the game and were able to get themselves on base and have some timely hits as well. But uh, nicely done by the O's. Anthony Santander hits a three-run opposite field homer in the sixth inning to get the O's on the board. You had Trey Mancini coming up with a big RBI hit. And for the first time, kind of most of the order contributed in this one. The only guy who didn't contribute was Ryan Mountcastle, who went 0 for 4 with a strikeout. But seven of the Orioles' nine batters had a hit. Now, the issue was all of them had just one hit, and that adds up to seven. The only two who didn't have a hit were Mountcastle, as I mentioned, and then Robinson Chirinos, who went 0 for 3, but did draw a leadoff walk against Chapman in the top of the ninth inning, trying to start an Oriole rally when they did get two on against Chapman, but did not score when trailing by four. So everybody did something offensively, and the O's on the day as a team, they had 11 hard-hit balls, and they had seven hits, and they scored eight runs. So you know what? That's, that's a lot of progress offensively. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from this one, specifically on the offensive end, Austin Hayes put another good swing on a baseball. Hayes, who did not have a home run through the first 15 games of the season, has now homered in back-to-back games. Of course, hit the two-run homer on Sunday that ended up tying the game at six in the seventh inning, and then hits a three-run homer in the eighth inning of this one, which got the Orioles within two, made it a 10-8 game at the time. And it was interesting because the Orioles had two on and two outs in the eighth. They already had one run in on the Mancini RBI single. It was a 10-5 game. And the Yankees went to the bullpen, brought in Jonathan Luizaga, who last year was probably their best reliever. And he hangs a slider and Hayes hits it out down the left field line for a three-run homer. His two-run homer in Anaheim was also down the left field line off a hanging slider that he was able to stay in on and rip it down the line. So I'm liking what Hayes is doing. Average up to 250, OPS up to 755 on the season now. We know Austin Hayes needs not only a healthy season, but a productive season with all these talented outfielders ready to come up behind him in the minor leagues. And uh, another big game for Hayes back-to-back with the long ball. But the Orioles do lose the game by a score of 12-8. to Not their best pitching performance as they drop game one to the Yankees. But... There was a lot of other stuff going on in Birdland on Tuesday. A lot of news and notes from the majors and also from the minors. But we'll keep it at the major league level when we return. But first, got to tell you about Athletic Greens and AG1. Because our next partner, a product I use a lot. I started taking AG1 because I wanted better gut health and wanted more energy and really an optimized immune system as well. It can give you all of that stuff. But you're wondering... What is AG1 from Athletic Greens? Well, with one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, literally all the things. And I incorporate it in to help with digestion, help with energy, got to keep up the energy, recording five podcasts a week. And AG1 helps with that. And right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop, a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash MLB network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So the Orioles did have a tough loss at the major league level, losing 12-8 to the Yankees on Tuesday night. But wasn't the only thing going on in the majors for the O's on Tuesday as we get to some news and notes. And first of all, the Orioles did make a roster move before Tuesday's game. They placed right-handed pitcher Chris Ellis on the 10-day injured list, suffering from shoulder inflammation. It'll be retroactive to Monday. 
And they ended up recalling Alexander Wells, who, of course, pitched in the game Tuesday night. And listen, he gave up two solo home runs, one to Judge, one to Rizzo, that, again, was the one with the 10 expected batting average. But he, you know, gave the O's an inning in two thirds. And, you know, the two hits and the two runs he gave up were the two homers, three K's, no walks once again after, you know, he he came up originally once this year, had the season debut back on April 16th against the Yankees at Camden Yards through two scoreless, three hits, three Ks, and no walks. And I know he gave up the two homers, but one was literally a Mickey Mouse home run. And I thought he pitched pretty well again against the Yankees, to be honest, in relief. And I think Wells has probably earned a start at some point. And the question kind of becomes, you know, with Chris Ellis out, you know, he had that pretty good first start in Oakland of the year, four and a third scoreless. But then he starts the game in Anaheim on Sunday and goes walk, hit by pitch, walk, single walk, and is pulled from the game in favor of Travis Lakins, who, of course, gives up the grand slam, and it's 6-0 Angels in the first, and Ellis is charged with five runs without recording an out. And, you know, he left the game with trainer Brian Ebel and manager Brandon Hyde, and, you know, they're calling it shoulder inflammation. He'll go on the injured list. Really no timetable for Ellis right now. We'll see how that develops. But, you know, Ellis came up to take John Means' spot in the rotation. Now who takes Ellis's spot? I would argue for Alexander Wells. I mean, Ellis's spot comes up on Saturday. Wells pitched an inning and two-thirds on Tuesday night. I mean, you got three days off in between that. He could give you probably four-plus innings in Saturday's game. And, you know, to me, really, the other option is potentially Keegan Aiken. You know, he pitched on Sunday. If you maybe hold him out the rest of the week, he could start. And then my last option would be Kyle Bradish. I mean, he threw 86 pitches in his last start in Norfolk. He's looking good. He is scheduled to start Thursday for Norfolk. So if they pushed him back two days, that wouldn't really mess him up too, too much to start the game on Saturday. Heck, they can even, you know, push back kind of the rest of the rotation, bring up Bradish, maybe start him Friday at home against the Red Sox and push your Friday starter back to Saturday to keep Bradish, you know, in a more regular rotation and give a, another Orioles starter an extra day off. So we'll see who it's going to be with Ellis out. But I think Wells deserves a chance. But overall, I really think Bradish deserves a chance. And listen, those 86 pitches he threw in his last start, that's more than some Orioles starters have thrown yet this year. So he's built up, it seems. I think it's time to see Kyle Bradish. Some other news from the Major League level. Orioles got Tony Mancellino back finally on Tuesday night. Their third base coach who had missed the last 12 games with what the Orioles called an illness he was back coaching third. Uh, Anthony Sanders, their first base coach, also missed an extended amount of time. He returned on Friday in Anaheim after he missed nine games. The Orioles had uh, some members of the minor league coaching staff up just to help them out. But uh, yeah, so Mancelino back at third. Sanders back at first. Just happy to see them healthy and back with the Orioles. And then more good news. Masson is sending its broadcasters finally on the road again. Kevin Brown and Jim Palmer were in Yankee Stadium to call game one of the series in the Bronx on Tuesday. And it looks like for the rest of the year, they will be on the road. Of course, the Orioles and Masson announced at the beginning of the year that the TV broadcast crew would not be traveling, citing COVID reasons, but we all know it was for cost-cutting measures. These road series, especially the one in Anaheim, was rough. There was delay. You could tell from Kevin Brown calling the game. There was an echo. It was a disaster. They need to be in the ballpark. As a play-by-play -play broadcaster myself, you need to be in the ballpark. You need to be in the stadium, wherever it is. You have to be there to put out the best product possible. And the Orioles weren't doing that. But finally, Masson sends them there after 16 games. Now, on the flip side, the Orioles radio crew still not traveling. Of course, Jeff and Brett and Melanie and a little bit of Scott Garceau still, for the time being, going to do all the games from Camden Yards. I hope they send them to is the right thing to do, but we will see. But at least happy that, you know, Kevin and Jim Palmer and eventually Ben McDonald and Jeff Arnold and whoever does the games on TV will be on the road with the team as well. But that's your major league news for the Orioles. Also a lot of minor league news to get to from Tuesday, and we will get to that in just a second. But first, got to tell you about Built Bar because this is the best tasting protein bar out there. The thing about Built Bar is that all their bars taste like candy bars. They're delicious. You're getting a treat, but it's good for you because it's got 17 grams of protein. And you keep forgetting that it's a protein bar because it tastes so good. I keep thinking there's no way Built Bar can continue to do this, but they keep doing it. And now they've got new products like the Built Puffs. 
This is the first ever protein-infused marshmallow. It's covered in 100% chocolate. It's got protein. It's good for you. And oh, yeah, it's a chocolate-covered marshmallow. It's delicious as well. They can't keep doing it, but they continue to do it. So if you want to get your hands on the puffs, want to get your hands on the OG Built Bars, just head to Built.com and use the promo code LOCK15 and you'll get 15% off your purchase. Again, that is promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. So in this Orioles news and notes episode, we had some news from the majors, also some news from the minors this week. And, and let's start with a guy who was in the majors and then sent to the minor leagues. And that is DJ Stewart, who, of course, made the Orioles opening day roster, went 0 for 3 with two strikeouts, pinch hitting in each of the Orioles' first three games in Tampa, and then was sent down to AAA Norfolk, spent a little bit of time in Norfolk, played every couple of days, and then was DFA'd off the 40-man roster because the O's had to make room for a pitcher. And so he goes through waivers, and we talked about this last week when Stewart was designated for assignment. We actually had Bob Phelan on the show, and we were talking about it a bit. And, you know, we talked about the three outcomes. He gets claimed by another team. He doesn't get claimed, and the Orioles release him. Or he doesn't get claimed, and the Orioles put him back in AAA. And Bob seemed to think that Stewart would get claimed. And, and you know, there's definitely there was definitely a possibility that that would have happened. You know, still left-handed bat, still gets on base at a good clip. He still has power in that bat. But the flip side is, doesn't hit for a high average. Strikes out a lot as well. Can't play the field literally at all. He has to be a DH. And it just hasn't gone well in his major league career so far. Well, he did not get claimed. And because he hasn't been in the majors for long enough, he actually can't refuse the demotion to AAA. So the Orioles assigned him to AAA Norfolk. So he's still in the organization, but is no longer on the Orioles 40-man roster. And He's been on the 40-man since 2018. Like, it's been a long time on the 40-man for DJ Stewart. And the O's passed him through waivers. Nobody wanted to take a chance on him on a waiver claim. And that does say a lot at, at where DJ Stewart is right now because he has options. So, you know, if another team claimed him, they wouldn't have to keep him on the Major League roster. He still has options this season, meaning a team could have claimed him and theoretically they would have had to keep him on the 40-man roster, but they could have stashed him away in triple a and not had to take up a major league roster spot while they tried to, you know, revamp the swing or whatever. So I think it, you know, shows even more about what other teams think of Stewart that he did not get claimed. So he goes down to triple a Norfolk and I don't really know where he goes from now. I mean, for now he sits on this team as kind of the fourth or fifth outfielder, a pinch hitter who's going to play every couple of days. But you look at the Norfolk outfield right now. I mean, you got Kyle Stowers, hit another home run on Tuesday. He's got a 1,022 OPS. He is ranking in AAA. You got Robert Newstrom. He homered in Norfolk's game on Tuesday. He's got an 847 OPS. He's got four homers on the year with that big power swing from the left side. You got Tyler Nevin, who's playing a lot of infield, but also plays the outfield. 993 OPS, been swinging a real hot bat early in the season. I want to see him soon in the big leagues. How about Johnny Riser? You know, his average hasn't been great. The 695 OPS, the average under 200, but he's leading the Norfolk Tides with five home runs. He's second in this Orioles system with his five home runs. So he's flashing some power. And then, you know, after all of those guys, you've still got Yusniel Diaz, who's on the injured list, but had a hot start to the season. And whenever he comes back from the IL, he is going to have a lot more chances to get at bats than DJ Stewart because the Orioles want to get a look at Yusniel Diaz. I think they kind of know what DJ Stewart is right now. And he'll hang around on this roster, but I got to be honest. You know, maybe it's when Yusniel Diaz comes back, or maybe it's when an outfield prospect from AA is ready to come to AAA. But, you know, Stewart may stick in Norfolk for now, but I would not be surprised if the Orioles just straight up released him at some point in the near future. There's just, there's not space for him to get at bats at this point. The Orioles have seen... Definitely enough at the major league level in terms of sample size. I think his time as an Oriole is over, and I hope he catches on somewhere else, but I think it just might be it for DJ Stewart. And again, he's still here, and maybe he'll still play in Norfolk for a bit, but it's got to be getting pretty, pretty close to the end, even though you know we thought the DFA was the end, but here he is right back here. And I can't see him coming back to the big leagues because even if the O's need an outfielder, 
Stowers, Newstrom, Nevin, all deserve it way more. And hopefully Diaz at some point if he's healthy. We'll see. We'll see what happens with Stewart. But that really wasn't the biggest minor league news from Tuesday because the biggest news, Adley Rutschman back on the baseball field, starting his rehab assignment from that tricep injury that kept him out for most of spring training and all the season so far. Rutschman starting his rehab assignment in Aberdeen, at High A Aberdeen on Tuesday night. Got the start at catcher, uh, was hitting second in the lineup. Ended up going one for two. His first two ABs were from the left side. First one hit a screaming line drive to left field that was caught. Second AB ripped a double down the right field line. And then third AB, that was from the right side, and he drew a walk. So one for two with a walk. He played five innings. Uh, he was able to catch um, Gene Pinto for those five innings, which was cool as well. Obviously, a lot of Orioles fans love Gene Pinto, who's now into the Orioles' top 30 prospects. Pinto goes five innings, four hits, two runs, four Ks, and a walk. And that was cool to see Rutschman back there with Pinto. He had one chance to throw out a base runner, wasn't able to do it. Um, but other than that, good to see him back on the field. Aberdeen's game tonight, it's scheduled to be about 40 degrees at first pitch in Aberdeen. So maybe Adley gets Wednesday off and then is back in the lineup Thursday. But uh, the Ironbirds are at home. So if you want to go see Adley Rutschman, head out to Ripken Stadium. It's a beautiful ballpark. I wish there was a broadcaster on the Aberdeen broadcast. But uh, that's uh, that's an issue for another day. But great to have Adley back. In terms of the timeline, you know, it's really interesting because it's obviously not going to be like, oh, he's back in Baltimore this Sunday. And he's going to do more rehab than just Aberdeen. He's probably going to go to Bowie and he's probably going to go to Norfolk for a bit. And I think the Orioles would probably target a home game. Like, let, let's be honest here. They're going to want Adley Rutschman's major league debut, the face of the franchise in the future, the number one overall pick, the number one prospect in baseball. They're going to want him to debut at home. Now, the O's start a homestand this Friday, the last 10 days, and goes through May 8th. Adley could be ready that you know weekend against Kansas City, the sixth, seventh, and eighth. But you know, how about a how about a debut against the Yankees? How about May sixteenth, little Monday night action against the Yankees? Or if you want to do a weekend, maybe you wait till Tampa Bay comes in on the twentieth. But I would guess that homestand in mid May, the sixteenth through the twenty second, the Yankees and the Rays. That's my guess for when Adley Rutschman finally makes his major league debut. But he wasn't the only star of that Aberdeen game on Tuesday night. Ignacio Feliz pitched in relief in that game. Remember, he was an Orioles minor league rule five pick. The right-handed pitcher came out of the Padres system last year. He has been unbelievable at high A Aberdeen this year. Feliz, three scoreless hitless innings with eight strikeouts and one walk on Tuesday night. Feliz has now recorded 32 outs this season for Aberdeen, 26 of them have been strikeouts. Let me say that again. 26 strikeouts in just shy of 11 innings of work. 26 of 32 outs have been strikeouts. That's a ridiculous number. 10 and two-thirds, 26 strikeouts. That is ridiculous. So shout out to Ignacio Feliz. And then Kobe Mayo, a top five Orioles prospect, two home runs in the game on Tuesday night in Aberdeen. Maybe showing off with Adley there and with a lot of media and a lot of eyes on Adley, well, Kobe Mayo did his thing as well. And then finally, Grayson Rodriguez did uh, start the game for AAA Norfolk on Tuesday. It was supposed to be a morning start, 11 a.m. Weather actually pushed it back to 12.30. And uh, Gray Rod did give up three runs in the first. They ended up being called earned runs, but if you watch the play, there was a two-out play by Richie Martin that should have been made at shortstop, should have been called an error. It ended up being called a hit, so they should have been three unearned runs. Uh, but Grayrod settled down. He, he went four innings, six hits, the three runs, five Ks, and a walk. And uh, he threw 76 pitches, which is a new high in terms of the pitch count for Grayson Rodriguez this season. So even though he only threw four innings, the pitch count was at its highest. So he's continuing to build up on the mound. And uh, hopefully sometime soon, along with Adley, we can see Grayson Rodriguez in the big leagues. But that's your Orioles news and notes from Tuesday. O's lose to the Yankees. But they're right back at tonight, the Wednesday night game, game two of the series in the Bronx at Yankee Stadium. Orioles and the Yankees, the O's try and even the series up at one. Yankees will send the left-hander, Jordan Montgomery, to the hill. The 29-year-old will make his fourth start. He's got a 2-5-1 ERA with 11 strikeouts 
in 14 and a third innings on the season. His last start against Detroit on the 21st, six innings, three hits, a run, five Ks, and two walks. He also pitched pretty well at Camden Yards earlier this year on April 15th against Baltimore. Five scoreless innings, three hits, two Ks, and two walks in that one. And he will go up against Tyler Wells, the Orioles' 27-year-old right-hander making his fourth career start. He's got a 6.75 ERA, 6 Ks in eight innings so far this season. His last start wasn't great in Oakland on the 21st, two and a third, five hits, two runs, a K, and no walks. But his one good start this year did come against the Yankees back on April 16th at Camden Yards. Four scoreless innings, three hits, three Ks, and two walks. Would love to see Wells bounce back and replicate that here in this Wednesday night game. And then we will be back you here on the pod with you tomorrow, recapping everything from game two of the series between the Orioles and and Yankees, and continuing to key in on everything happening in Birdland. But that's coming up on tomorrow's episode. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.